How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today, as I had announced earlier, our uh, portion of the is a portion of the second lesson from Hebrews chapter thirteen. Uh, I read here again, beginning at verse seven. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, History is <clears throat> peppered with calls to remember. Remember the Alamo has always been popular in Texas. Remember the main uh, U.S. warship sunk in Havana Harbor in 1898 was a slogan of the Spanish-American War. Remember Pearl Harbor posters were popular during World War II. The, the same concept sort of flipped as a, a negative has come about in our time. Never forget 9-11. Urging us to, to keep in mind the events of the destruction of the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington. Why? Such calls to remember are, are never really uh, merely a call for preserving raw historical data. R rather, there is an implication in these that these kinds of events involve lessons to be learned and urge us toward a change of behavior. Frankly, in all the examples that I've listed, there is more than a little call for vengeance and uh, defense of violent action. Uh, simply put, these calls to remember involve a call to war. The Bible, too urges God's people to remember various events and people. And, and, and rarely are these things nothing more than a, a, a mere preservation of the facts. Remember your creator. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Jesus' predictions of his resurrection. Remember Jesus Christ himself. All of these uh, things with a decidedly more positive spin are urged upon God's people as things worthy of our attention and our memory. They, 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 they ask us to, to mull these uh, events or these people and their lives over and to take to heart the truths that they teach. And they lead us towards a change of direction in our faith in life. We have an example of just this kind of thing in the words of the letter to the Hebrews, uh, author unknown, that are in front of us today. There we are urged to remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. Remember your leaders because their life inspires your imitation. Their vigilance deserves your confidence and their conduct invites your prayers. Pastors, Sunday school teachers, 
other church leaders who were involved in handling the word of God through, whether it's through teaching or preaching, are, of course, not perfect people. They will, at one time or another, let you down. I have often said the same of myself. If it's not already happened, the time will come when I will likely let you down in some way. And yet at the same time, we have to understand that all these people are people in whom the gospel is working. God's own spirit is living. And their lives are leading to a glorious future. And so the writer to the Hebrews here urges us to, uh, to remember them because their lives inspire our imitation. Remember your leaders who spoke God's word to you as you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Well, let's be clear, first of all, about the meaning of this phrase, the outcome of their lives. Don't think, say, like in terms of uh, financial success. As a pastor, I am not the best source, maybe not even a good source, for how to find uh, wealth and uh, financial security. I mean, I, I know some things about this for myself, but I'm not the kind of person to look to. When you uh, look at the TV preachers, there you often see people who live uh, fantastically wealthy lives. I, I can think of one just in the last year or two who was holding a uh, fundraiser and plugging it so that he could purchase his uh, either second or third personal jet. And they, they put a big emphasis on that kind of thing in their lives. But most of the real preachers that I know, the ordinary ones, uh, live lives of a rather ordinary, middle-of-the-road kind of prosperity, neither particularly rich nor particularly poor. And that's as it should be. That's not something that should surprise us. The, the Apostle Paul uh, once warned his young pastor friend, Timothy, to be on his guard and to watch out for those who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. It is not. It will often relieve you more of your riches than it will help you to build them up. And that's really more uh, our job. Uh, our job as preachers and teachers is, is not uh, to help you uh, find your way to uh, fantastic wealth. Uh, it is rather to teach you to trust God's promises for your daily bread and then to use the blessings that he gives to you faithfully in a way that loves and serves your neighbor. Let's not let selfish gain worm its way either into your pastor's message and motivations nor uh, the life and goals of God's people. Nor is the outcome of their lives mostly about achieving a more modest kind of happiness based on solid families, strong relationships, respectable reputations in the community, healthy bodies, or other more moderate, if you will, uh, wholesome and simple pleasures that are like that. Now, I, I don't deny that certain biblical principles will certainly help to lead in that kind of direction. And yet we have to understand that, that in this fallen world, in this world broken and, and, and crushed by sin, there, there are no guarantees. And all of the Christian leaders that I know, all the Christian pastors, all the leaders in congregations are still people who, who experience the, the, the same sorrows and difficulties of everybody else. They suffer major catastrophes. They have to fight through uh, big tragedies and everyday frustrations, just like the rest. Let me tell you about one particular pastor's wife that I know. She herself grew up in a pastor's home. Her dad was a minister. And her father struggled with depression. 
As a result of his uh, mood swings, the family life was often not very happy. It also made it difficult for him to carry out his pastoral responsibilities. The family struggled financially. I can remember her telling me once that when she was a little girl, she would dream about having a piece of chicken to chew between her teeth because meat was something that was so rare for them to have. In her own married life, her husband, also a minister, things went much better. But now that her children are grown, three of the four of them have broken homes. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the family didn't enjoy many, many blessings as well. But understand that the, the way of life and the faith that they had has not removed all problems. It has not led to uh, just uh, unqualified, unending, earthly success and pleasure either. The real outcome of their way of life is this. In the end, the final outcome is heaven. When Christian leaders live Christian lives based on their faith in Jesus Christ, the same word of God that they preach and that they teach, that doesn't earn a place in heaven. It doesn't certainly rise to the level of deserving a place in heaven. But in the end, it leads to heaven's door. That faith which in spite of our personal sinful failures will continue to look to Jesus Christ and to trust him because it recognizes that he is a source of all grace and forgiveness. We, 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 we confess and bring our sins to him and he cleanses us of all those sins and he's always happy to welcome us back. Such a faith trusts Jesus in tragedy. It looks to him and leans on him to persevere through pain. And it gets us through this life all the way to our heavenly home. Be faithful. Even to the point of death, Jesus told the congregation in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, and I will give you the crown of life. He does not change. Uh, Jesus promised this to his people. And because he makes that promise, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that these promises are, are ours as much today as they were for those people, though we don't live with them thousands of years ago, and though not all of us may be leaders in the same sense in our Christian congregations. But he is the same. He does not change. And so these promises apply to us yet today. Admittedly, we cannot see the outcome of the way of life that we have in these Christian leaders uh, with our eyes uh, until we get to heaven itself. But we can, we can hear it. We can hear it in the, the, the same message of God's grace that they preach. We, 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 can, we can see it in the faith that they live out. Remember your leaders and where their faith life leads. And then it will inspire you to imitate them. Now, not only as we look back at the lives of those leaders in the past, nor look ahead to where that life is going, but as we consider the, the care that they provide to God's people right now, we find another reason to, to remember our leaders, to focus our attention upon their life and their message uh, and the author of Hebrews now goes on to tell us that their vigilance deserves our confidence. Obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief for that would be real. Going back to the King James Version, translate the first phrase of this passage, obey your leaders. It's kind of next phrase, which is submit. It's 
that in our own language so boring for a moment today. The, the behind that word would in most contexts be translated something like uh, be convinced or be persuaded. It, it seems to understand that as Christian people, we're, we aren't always. We aren't always convinced or persuaded by the, the word of God that our pastors or teachers preach to us. We, we aren't always convinced or persuaded or confident in the message that they have to say. And in some cases, that might be okay. Even the most godly leaders in the Christian church do not speak as God's mouthpiece on certain matters of politics or science or culture or other matters of personal preference. I personally may have some very strong opinions about all of those things, and I think that they're good ones. But you are free to take them or to leave them, as the case may be. But when it's not just the minister, but when it's actually God's word that comments on something, whether it is a matter of politics, science, culture, or personal opinion, there we do well to listen to those Christian leaders and to let their application of scripture and preaching of God's word persuade us of the truth. Some years ago, I counseled a young man who had come to me because he was not happy with the rules that his parents had laid down for him in the house in which he lived. He didn't like the bedtimes or the curfews that they had set. He, he thought that he was too old for the, what they had decided. He, he, he didn't like the rules they had about uh, some of the entertainment things he could do, what he could watch on television or the movies, what kind of music he could listen to. And I would have to admit that in and of itself, the rules were not scripturally determined. They come from their own judgment. But at the same time, he was a minor living in his parents' home. And on that issue, the scripture is clear. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. He could freely disregard those when he got off on his own someday and was living on his own. But for now, as a minor living in his parents' home, God called on him to submit himself to those things. That's not what he wanted to hear. But as a Christian leader, that is the counsel I had to give and expect him to be persuaded and to obey. One reason for confidence in the biblical teaching of our leaders is they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Now, I am sure that those uh, preachers and teachers exist who simply deliver a message, and collect their paycheck. And I suppose you could say that in some ways these words of uh, Hebrews 13 really aren't applying to them so much. I suppose at the same time there are those Christian church members who don't want some preacher or teacher meddling in their personal beliefs or behavior. But that is what we've been called to do. That is why we have been sent. God has sent them to keep our souls safe and healthy and see to it that they make it all the way through life to our home with him. That requires vigilance, a watching out as the author of Hebrews alludes here. The Christian leader must be on his watch constantly uh, against the false teachings from the outside that would uh, attack our faith and damage it. He has a responsibility to be vigilant, to be watchful, so that the wolves don't come in and destroy our faith. But there's another kind of watchfulness and vigilance that has to be maintained. Uh, the the, 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 the 
Christian leader who brings God's word to God's people uh, must also be watchful and vigilant in observing the lives and the words of the people that he serves. Because these things are a measure, an indication of the personal health of their souls. Years ago, when I worked on my uncle's farm, one of the first responsibilities that I was given was feeding the calves. Now, it wasn't enough just for me to uh, put the pail of feed in the calf's pen and then walk away. Uh, I also needed to see whether or not the calf ate anything. And, and while I was there, I should kind of size the animal up and see, how is it moving? How is it behaving? Uh, how is it just physically looking? All of those things, not, not just that it gets food, but whether it eats it and uh, how it is behaving are an indication of the animal's health. So the vigilant preacher or teacher doesn't just put a bucket of God's word in front of you and hope that you eat it. But he has a responsibility to see the effects, if you will, to listen to the things that you have to say, to see the way that you live your life, and to observe whether that word is having the proper effect, whether it is having uh, the desired application to your soul. The pastor doesn't do it just to be a busybody, but because he's caring for your immortal soul, the vigilance, that kind of vigilance deserves our confidence as we remember our leaders. Finally, there is something that then we can do for them. Their conduct invites your prayers. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience wanting to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. Not a week goes by that people don't ask me for prayers for some reason or another, and I'm happy to do it. But understand that I don't pray for them because somehow the pastor has a, a better connection with God that uh, other people don't have. I, I don't have any uh, direct connection. I, I base my prayers uh, on the, the same grace of God, and they flow from the same faith that you all have. I don't pray only because it's my job as a pastor. I mean, obviously, it does go along with my call. And uh, you would expect that prayer would be a regular part of my life in this kind of work. And it is. In fact, the older I get, the more time I devote to prayer because it becomes clearer and clearer to me just how much that is necessary. Very little, if any good, ever gets done without God's direct involvement in the process. And so we pray. But the reason I pray for you primarily is because God has commanded it. And we have a promise that he's going to respond to it. And then I genuinely care about the people, about you, that I've been called to serve. You are people who have supported me as your leader in this place. You have shared the sweat and the labor of gospel work. I don't want you to struggle. I don't want you to suffer. I do want to see you get all the way through the challenges of life at the end to share with me our mutual home in heaven with God. So I pray. The writer to the Hebrews indicates that he hoped it's the same kind of a, a mutual relationship of love and service would lead the people to whom he was writing to pray for him as well. He had genuinely worked, he says, to conduct himself honorably while he was among them. He didn't carry a guilty conscience about this, but he had, he had done his utter best to serve these people faithfully. And so he prayed or asked that in return they would pray for him, that his service and his conduct would invite their prayers, as I also ask of you. So remember your leaders. 
both for the blessings that this can mean for you and the blessings it means for them. Amen. Please stand.